very much. It's very nice to, to be here. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, has a couple of different sort of origins. It's um, more or less comes from this book I've just finished, from the 21st century fiction. Um, but it's also the uh, something I, that occurred to me when I was writing 21st century fiction is how prevalent images of manufactured bodies are um, in the 21st century in particular. But the, the, the image of the prosthetic manufactured body seems to me uh, productive in ways that I'm maybe just beginning to think about. And I, I'm, writing a, I'm writing a book now that will be finished soon, a little bit. Um, and then I'm intending, sort of, to write a book called Prosthetics, which will be emerging from this interest, a kind of history of the novel as a form of manufactured life. Um, which most of the time, most times that I say that, people smile and think that's a stupid idea. And it probably is. So I don't, I, I don't really know how certain I am that Prosthetics is my next project, but, it, but this, this is where I think in that in that form in the book that I've just finished. Um, having said that, it, so it, it is something quite general that I'm trying to think about, but I'm going to offer something really quite specific here, because as I say, I've more or less taken this from the, from the book that I've just finished. And I'm going to think about some, some contemporary art, contemporary performance artists, before then going on to think uh, about manufactured, copied being in uh, Ishiguri's novel. So if you hate that one, you're going to have to listen to me talking about it for a while. Um, I don't know what I think about it myself, but there, but there we go. Um, and I have a little, uh, never remember the words, nephrograph, is it? I got a bit confused with that um, uh, From Pierre Machere, who people don't read as much now as they used to, um, uh, and the epigraph is this, that the work has no interior, no exterior, or rather its interior is like an exterior, shattered and on display. Thus it is open to the searching gaze, heal, disembowel. That's out of any context, but I, that, that, that I hope will uh, sit in the back of our minds as well. So it's, it's possible to see, uh, I think I'll be trying to suggest here, over the last decade, a growing and persistent, obsessive interest in the imaginative possibilities that emerge with the evolution of the various manufactured bodies that we now have available to us to thought and to the imagination. Uh, that is the prosthetic body. I suppose we might have the uh, paramedics in our mind probably here. The electronically augmented body, the surgically and genetically enhanced body, the hybrid human animal body, uh, the body made in cyberspace, the body made in a petri dish uh, in a laboratory uh, in the Ministry of Defence. This emerging interest in manufactured life turns in part around its capacity to bring biological material to a new kind of visibility. This is something I'm going to be to explore. It, the manufactured body detaches our conception of lived humanity from the experience and perception of naked biological embodiment. To reproduce the components of living beings industrially or artificially brings the body out of hiding, laying bare the biological hardware that has tended to be cloaked by myth. Across a range of contemporary art practices, I'll argue here, one can see an attempt to engage with this manufactured body. I don't know whether people have read Rebecca Scroot's account of Henrietta Lacks. People know that. Um, Henrietta Lacks, a, a woman whose cells, it turns out, are immortal. <laughs> but but this, is a, this is a very, very important example of manufactured life, which I won't engage with. Um, uh, across a range of contemporary art practices, I'll argue here, one can see an attempt to engage with the manufactured body, to find in the condition of the embodiment that it suggests a new way of laying the open body out so we can rethink the relationship between political subjectivity and bare life. 
The idea of the self as the guardian of its own discrete memories, which are attached in turn to the longer historical record of our culture, has been supported by the collective fantasy of a human consciousness that is not reducible to animal matter, that is animated in some way by spirit or by the divine. Our histories and our identities have been stored in the cultural imagination in this spirit realm, which is secreted inside us within the brief embrace of our mortal coil. Um, the encounter with the reproducible body in contemporary art and literature suggests a new or different way of thinking about this relationship between spirit and matter, between weightless memory preserved in consciousness and a mortal animal body which returns to dust. As biotechnologies reveal the genetic codes of being reshaping the relationship between interiority and exteriority, and as information technologies radically extend our being in time and in space, a representation of the artificial body in 21st century culture produces a remarkable remapping of the way that history and consciousness clings to flesh, the way that time and being flow through a re-regulated body. But that's what I'm going to try and look at today. And in the contemporary sculpture, uh, the contemporary, contemporary sculptor Patricia Piccinini. Uh, do any, does anyone here know the work of Patricia Piccinini? Um, not, you're not well known. Um, her work has turned obsessively around this production of artificial life uh, and suggests the potential that new bio, biotechnologies have for transforming the way that we inhabit and see our bodies. In the last 10 years, she writes in 2002, Patricia Piccinini in an essay that accompanies her rather remarkable sculpture, Still Life with Stem Cells. In the last 10 years, the body has gone from something that is, that is uniquely produced to something that can be reproduced, which was this in 2002. Bicinini sees her work as responding to the effect that this intrusion of the reproducible has on the way that we think about and experience our own singularity. Um, so this is a, can you see that? Um, still Life, uh, this, which was exhibited in the 2002 Biennale of Sydney and the 2003 Venice Biennale, depicts a super real little girl um, playing with amorphous lumps of matter, which the title of the piece suggests are life forms modelled from stem cells. Stem cells, um, stem cells Pichonine has described uh, in a different place as the biomatter of the digital age is an interesting combination of material and virtuality, I think, the biomatter for the digital age. The effect of this piece, which I think is a, a kind of visceral and a disturbing piece yeah, in all sorts of ways, it, is to make of the body something strange, to make its own plasticity suddenly both newly visible and oddly uncontained. It kind of leaks out of itself. On first viewing, you may all completely disagree with this uh, response to this uh, sculpture, but on first viewing, it's easy, I think, not to see the little girl at all, who's modelled with such realism that she seems natural, uh, not really there. Uh, the immediate impact of the piece is made by the undifferentiated life forms with which the girl is playing. These are made of a material that looks like flesh, each of the lumps approximating to something like a borderline living creature. And there's a, there's a biological cast to each of these shapes. And the first bite of the piece, I think, is the recognition that these plastic things, which call urgently but mutely towards biological animation, do not fit within any of the boundaries by which we habitually frame and recognize life. The shudder they cause Anyone else feel a shudder when they open this? You're completely blind to these things, but it doesn't matter. Um, but the shudder they cause me, anyway, derives from their simultaneous belonging to and refusal of living form. The shapes perform the same kind of challenge to our modes of perception that Piccinini describes experiencing on first seeing stem cells in a petri dish. Uh, the stem cells, she writes, have been differentiated into heart cells thin skin of biological matter smeared into the dish, she says, was pulsating to a rapid but steady rhythm. 
The cells, she says, were, quote, doing what heart cells do, beating, flatly, geometrically, pointlessly. Now, it's this uncanny abstraction of biological material from the work of being, um, its alienation from our conception of life that would give the beating of heart cells a purpose or, or a point, um, that first strikes one, I think, on viewing still life with stem cell. The lumps of fleshy matter reveal a kind of substrate of being, the generic plastic material from which the body is made, that is disturbing and strange because it undermines our tendency to think of life as something that has a magical supplement, something that involves more than the industrial reproduction of living matter. Uh, people have read uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road in recent years, so that's another place where the, the experience of being in that novel is that you're, it's consciousness, the fact that you're alive, that keeps your body from rotting, because we're all food. You know? uh, and consciousness is a kind of preservative, like salt. You know? <laughs> so if you keep your food alive in order to keep it, to keep it living. And, and, and again, it produces this reflection on the kind of industrial production of living matter and what that means. But if this uncanny quality means that the lumps of matter in Piccinini's sculpture attract the eye first, the real work of the piece, I think, happens when our attention is drawn back from the amorphous flesh to the girl herself. There's a shock that attends the delayed recognition that the girl, whose form is so familiar as to be almost invisible to us, is made of the same plastic stuff as the life forms, which do not conform to a recognizable species or shape. The sculpture, I think, is highly attentive to, to touch. Um, the sculpture is highly attentive to touch, to the girl's cradling of the piglet-like lump in her arm, to the touch of the girl's hand on the pet lump that curls at her feet. And it's in this over-determined contact between silicon modeled as human and si silicon modeled as genetic biomass that the piece comes to its own kind of unreadable life. The contact between biomatter and girl shapes the girl's model of the body out of the formal limits that allow us to package her up, forcing us to recognize the continuity between girl and matter, between our assumption of the singular being of the child and our distaste for the generic plastic material from which it is made. In the space of that touch, a contact between the girl and the shaped cells, the sculpture brings the body out of its human disguise, opening a new and unnerving channel between life and material. The body of the girl spills out of itself, exceeds itself, entering into these obscene gobbets of stuff, breaking the frame of the human as it does so. Piccinini's work is part of a very broad spectrum of contemporary sculpture, perceptual and performance art, that turns around the remodeling and remaking of the body, and of the ways in which consciousness is lodged within it or structured around it, depending on your phenomenology. Um, Eduardo Katz's uh, work, do people know Eduardo um, his, uh, his work, particularly his, you, people will know, I think, his. Um, Controversial production of a, a fluorescent rabbit. You know that? And messed around with some genes and produced a rabbit that was in the dark. Um, uh, his work has attracted a lot of attention. As has, he also uh, wasn't him, I don't think, but a colleague of his who produced the mouse of the ear. Um, uh, that work has produced much attention, as has the work of artists such as Vanessa Beecroft. Uh, and perhaps most notably the French performance artist Orland. Um, for all of these artists, the contemporary imagining and representation of the body produces a new understanding of how an intimate inside might open itself to view, and how such an opening of the body might move us beyond the limits, the sort of understood limits of human being, allowing us at once to see freshly the frames which make us read to each other, and to break such frames, to refashion them so that a new category of being becomes merely thinkable. But if all these artists fashion a new visibility, they do so in a way that offers at the same time a kind of radical challenge to our perception of the visible 
and of our understanding of the relationship between the hidden and the revealed, the visible and the invisible, the knowable and the unknown. Uh, Vanessa B. Cross worked, who know Vanessa B. Cross worked, excuse the new team, I'm sorry about that. Um, I can't talk about her without showing um, Vanessa B. Cross worked, for example, her display of cloned mass nudity in the new National Gallery in Berlin uh, and in the Guggenheim collection uh, in 2001 offers, like Piccinini's work, to bring the body out of hiding to make it available to the gaze without any of the forms that would normally attend and frame nakedness. As Giorgio Gambon has written in his rather stunning response to being possible, um, the display of 100 naked women, um, the display of 100 naked women standing in the new National Gallery in plain sight with bored and impertinent expressions staged a kind of exposure of the human body and evaded the frames and the habits of looking that allow us to see the body at all. The spectacle of clothed men viewing naked women summons a long history of pornography and erotica as well as sadomasochism and torture. But Beecroft's piece, again, suggests, doesn't fit within any of the frames that allow us to understand nudity or exposure or defenselessness. The power relationship between the heavily clothed vis visitors it was a very cold winter, so all these men that were wandering around in the space were kind of muffled up. Um, and the power relationship between these clothed visitors and the blankly revealed models, or whatever you would call them, um, seemed, Gandon writes, to be inverted as the models cast their empty gazes towards the, what, what Gandon calls the defenseless spectators. The effect of this excess nudity, this surplus of bodily visibility, seemed peculiarly enough to Gandon less to reveal the naked women than to discomfort the clothed spectators. And in this reversal, the very thing the show sets out to display, that is, nudity, seems uh, to disappear, to adopt a disguise fashioned from blank excess exposure. In this ample and well-illuminated space, <coughs> down the night, where a hundred female bodies of various ages, races and shapes were on display, which the gaze could examine with ease and in detail, there seemed to be no trace of nudity. And I think you can sort of get that, just from that picture. Um, the effect of Beecroft's work for the Gambon is to make us freshly aware that naked presence or what he calls naked corporeality, doesn't come easily to view, or doesn't make itself visibly visible simply by virtue of the removal of clothing. To completely liberate nudity from the patterns of thought that permit us to conceive of it, the Gambling one, to completely liberate nudity from the patterns of thought that permit us to conceive of it is a task that requires uncommon lucidity. Work like Beecroft's and Piccinini's, which provoke a shift in such patterns of thought bring naked corporeality into view, but in so doing, they damage the apparatuses with which we make the body legible. Both artists are interested in the representation of matter, Piccinini's biomatter of the digital play, and the work of both might be read alongside the emergence of a new interest in realism in the 21st century, what Hal Foster in a much discussed book is called The Return of the Real. But what we find, find with this work is that the surplus of material present that is its most striking characteristic, the exposure of a kind of unregulated and overwhelming flesh, is also a deficit, as if these artists are fashioning a new alloy, compounded of circuit and black. It's in the work of the French artist Orlan that these contradictions that inherent in the bearing of biological material come to their perhaps most striking the most visceral visual expression. Um, how many people have seen a one as well? It's not very nice. Um, I, I don't know why I'm talking about it, but I do uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, in her surgery performances of the 1990s, um, this is her, what she does, in, um, one of the things she does is to, have to do live performances where, as you can see, what's about to happen here, the um, 
a surgery will. That she, at one point, she decided to have as big a nose as it was possible for the human face to sustain. Another time, she was made to look like the Mona Lisa. And she'll, she'll read from Heidegger or whatever uh, various texts and conduct her own sort of performance poetry whilst live on ca several cameras in the operation theatre whilst, whilst the surgeon is uh, operating on her. And there's something that happens when the, when the face sort of comes away from the little under pinnings as she's talking that is absolutely unforgettable. <laughs> Although, uh, somebody came to Sussex to talk about this seven years ago. You might have been there, might have been there. Um, and they, there was a warning on the poster that said, you know, only come if, if you're, if you're mm -hmm. not in a nervous disposition. And of course, that meant that there were thousands of people. <laughs> 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 and, and, and the person talking played, played a bit of that performance where a woman's speaking and her face sort of comes away. And the surgeon gets his fingers and lots of people fainted. Because um, it really is, it really is a very strange thing that happened. Um, so the surgery performance is in which Orlan undergoes highly invasive cosmetic surgery, often on her face, whilst conscious and reading or speaking to the camera, produce a kind of radical disassembly of elements of voice and flesh. I turn my body, Orlan writes in 2008, into a set of prostheses which have no other function than to disseminate my disassembled body into the spaces of others. Her aim in her performance art, she says, is to undo the biological and symbolic unity of skin. And surgery performances do this by breaking all out herself open, by opening her face to view. And when that face comes away from the skeletal structure, and there's still a voice, you think, where's the voice? <coughs> it's, a really, it's a really odd, and unsettling, and as I say, unforgettable thing to win. Um, the effect of opening Orland's face while her voice continues to speak or to emanate eerily from a dark wet space somewhere within her head suggests an incredible dismantling of the elements that have gone into our comprehension of articulate life. A dismantling which comes to expression in a different register, I think, in David Lynch's film. Marble and Drive. Does everyone remember the scene in Club Silencio in Marble and Drive where the woman's singing and then she sort of dies and faints and her voice continues on and, you, and we all know that the film edits voice and image together but we still can't quite believe it. So when that happens, when a voice continues even though the woman has just died, it, it shocks us. It shocks us out of our assumption that voice comes within us from somewhere. We have to completely retune <laughs> our viewing apparatus. Um, Gianna Bouchard suggests that this opening of the body in Orland's work provides some kind of access to a hidden inside. Orland's wounds, Bouchard writes, are inflicted purposefully to provide access to her interiority. But as Bouchard herself acknowledges, the very access to interiority that the performance gives us is one which so unsettles our understanding of the relationship between inside and outside as to make the inside itself unavailable, to provoke instead a general failure of representation. Paul Anne writes that her aim is to place oneself outside of oneself, and this rupturing of the biological unity of the skin, this exceeding of the skin as a threshold between self and world, leads to precisely the failure or absence of more naked corporeality that a gambon finds in the Beacon's work. Indeed, a gambon could be describing Orland's work when he, he talks in his essay on Beacon about the effect of, on the viewer of Clement Susini's wax anatomical model uh, and its similar failure to reveal the body it denudes. I do include people know Susini's work, he's also he's done very brilliant faces out of wax as well, which are very strange. Um, so you see this wax, wax model opens the body just as all our surgical performances do, although of course without that added dimension of injury to living flesh, which is so central to what all is trying to do. One can remove the layers of this anatomical body one at a time, again we might, allowing first the abdominal and pectoral walls to appear, then the array of lungs and viscera 
inside the womb, um, uh, still covered by the greater omentum. Then the heart and the intestines, until finally inside the womb, one can make out a small fetus. But no matter how much we open the wax model and scrutinize it with our gaze, the naked body of the beautiful, disemboweled woman remains obstinately untamable. Orlan's body similarly remains untamable, even as she bears it to us. The more radical the, dis the disassembly of biological matter and human voice, the more difficult it is to find a mode of seeing that brings the living body into view. But it's precisely this dismantling of the apparatuses of seeing, or of the relationship to the other, that Orlan reaches for as a way of thinking about how the biological reproducibility of the body helps to reroute the relationships between people across the broken unity of the open skin. When Orlan's body opens, or when Susini's wax model disaggregates itself, we find that there's no revelation waiting for us inside. We do not find a secret waiting to be exposed. Rather, we find only the absence of that which lies beneath biological surfaces, the secret self, the soul, interiority, or whatever we want to call that, uh, which fuels the myth of the human. We discover in Gamblin's terms that the nudity new we expected to find is absent, or as he puts it, devoid of content. To know nudity, these artworks suggest, is not to know an object, but only an absence of veils. The naked women in B cross work do not reveal flesh, but rather depict the shadow of the clothes that have been removed. But this absence of a secret self lurking beneath or behind the folds of the skin is not a disappointment in these artworks, it's not a failure of some kind, but the very revelation they have to offer, the very shifting in our understanding of the relationship between presence and absence, between material and ideational being that is their form and content. To see nudity properly, as these works require us to do, to see nudity with what the Gamble calls uncommon lucidity, is to encounter first the impossibility of knowing the body without the help of any of the theological and ideological forms that have made the body visible to us. These forms, again, and suggest, are themselves a kind of clothing. The denudation of the body we see in Deepcroft and in Warland is one which confronts us with what we might think of as a vertigo of unknowing that occurs when the conventions of seeing and knowing are removed or disallowed. But if we are put through this denudation, there's also a kind of yield to these works in that the absence of knowing that they produce opens on to an encounter with what a gambling calls the very possibility of knowing. If we cannot know the body as we hoped or expected, what we see here is no ability itself, a kind of visual access to the ways in which we read knowledge from an encounter with naked or unformed matter. Seeing the body stripped of its ideological clothing or of its articulability allows one a privileged access to the trembling space of an open or unmade body in all its surplus materiality, the living body as it might be thought. To see a body naked, a Gambon writes, to encounter nakedness as these artists demand that we see it, means to perceive its knowability beyond every secret, before or beyond its objective predicate. This coming to an unstructured visibility of a material presence that evades our form of seeing, our forms of seeing, this, uh, uh, what again calls this dwelling of appearance in the absence of secrets is what the gamin calls the special trembling of a nudity summoned by Beecroft and by these artists of the reproducible body. So it's this struggle to see the body in its nudity, in its open and unbound state, that recurs in the fiction of the new century, I think, as novelists seek to respond to the transformation that the artificial reproducibility of the body has caused or has triggered in our understanding of the limits where the human source and the non-human star. Across the range of contemporary fiction, uh, and this is a difficult claim to try to substantiate if you want to, or I can try to, across the range of contemporary fiction, it's possible to detect a heightened awareness of the unregulated material presence of the body itself. The body is a surplus of manufactured flesh as it weaves in and out 
of the shifting cultural and aesthetic forms that make embodiment meaningful uh, or, or aesthetically pleasing, um, that construct for us a history, a space, and a time. Again and again, and with almost uncanny insistence, contemporary, contemporary novelists find themselves dwelling on the thought or the spectacle of a body which has come undone or unzipped or torn at the seams, so that the boundary between inside and outside is damaged or broken or disturbed. As the visual artists I've discussed here are fascinated with the process by which a certain gaze on the body tends to open it, to disrupt its biological unity, so across the range of fiction being written now, one can see an engagement with what one might call, what I call, um, unbound life. The novel today might suggest to us that the experience of embodiment itself under contemporary biotechnological and infotechnological conditions involves a complicated encounter with unraveled biological material, as if contemporary boy being has become a question of renegotiating the limits of our proliferating selves. It's perhaps Kazuo Ishiguru's novel, then I'll go wheeling to um, a 2005 novel, Let Never Let Me Go, that explores this condition most sort of uh, in the context of the contemporary phenomenon of artificial life. The, non the novel famously tells, how many people have read this novel? Um, the, the, the novel famously tells the story of a group of friends named Kathy, Ruth and Tommy as they grow up from a shared adolescence in a kind of idyllic boarding school named Hailsham to a rather bleak and isolated adulthood. The apparent simplicity of the novel, its blandness and lack of effect, is incredibly banal. Isn't it? And you'll see from the quotes I read out, it absolutely studiously avoids any lyricism or any emotional any poetry or anything like that. Um, the apparent simplicity of the narrative, its blandness and lack of effect, is skewed by the fact that it's always revealed in the text, but also strangely hidden, that the friends, Kathy, Ruth, and Tommy, are all genetically manufactured beings, clones grown to donate replacement organs to unseen recipients who, unlike the clones themselves, are fully human and who live, as a result, uh, somewhere outside in what's called the real world. The peculiar force of this narrative, its conjuring of a keen pathos from its studied lack of emotional drama or complexity, emerges from its depiction of a blandly striving consciousness that's imprisoned within an industrially produced body, within that genetic biomatter from which the goblets are modelled in still life with stem cell. Kathy, who's the novel's narrator, uh, as well as its main protagonist, speaks with an unguarded childishness of her memories of school, her friendships and enmities. It's very like listening to either 13 year old daughter, it's exactly what I listened to her, that blue set next to her, and stuff like that. Um, her hopes and frustrations, and there's a painful tug to her apparent unawareness that such memories are in some sense cancelled out or made barren and inconsequential by the partiality of her own copied, manufactured being. She knows that she is a clone, but the pathos of the text arises from the sense that she is unequal to the knowledge of her own artificiality, that she carries on thinking and dreaming and hoping, regardless of her acknowledged status as a medical commodity. Like Piccinini's evocation of heart cells beating pointlessly in a petri dish, the compelling clutch of the narrative, the turn of its screw, is that it gives a kind of life to abstracted biological material, to a being that exhibits the procedures, processes, and quotidian mental habits of life, without that element of human being that makes life readable, thinkable, and purposive. Kathy adopts a peculiarly intimate mode of address, which anyone is with another will test you speaking directly to the reader throughout. And the very uncanny and disturbing thing is that in addressing us in this way, the novel identifies and transgresses a limit that separates the human and the non-human, setting up a kind of stunted dialogue that takes place across a species boundary. 
so on the first page we get, I don't know how, how it was where, where you were, this is Kathleen addressing this with you, I don't know how it was where you were, but at Hailsham we had to have some kind of medical every week, as something through the office, because you know why you have to have a medical, because they're checking that you haven't messed up any of your precious bits and pieces, you know. In, in addressing us in this way, she, we assume that we too are right. In calling to us in this way repeatedly throughout the narrative, Cathy assumes that we too are players, that we grew up in a centre not unlike Pelsham, that we too have to undergo repeated medicals to check that we're looking after our valuable body parts properly. But in making this assumption, she produces a kind of line between her and us, a kind of limit that we ourselves interpose. A non clone leader, and perhaps there is no other addressed in this way, will refuse to some degree the kind of community or the kind of bond that this address reaches. This is structurally quite similar to the opening of Deleuze's novel Underdog. I think we read that way. It starts with the line, he speaks in your voice in Eric. And who doesn't think, that's not my voice, whether you're American or not, you know, there's that kind of incredible production of dissent from the assumption of community. Um, <coughs> So the non clone reader is, gonna, is, is going to refuse the kind of community, the kind of bond that this address reaches for. And in doing so, the reader and the narrator, the narrator conspire to demarcate this kind of boundary zone between the fully and partially or imperfectly human, between what Piccinini calls produced and reproduced life. Now, to agree this demarcation of a boundary between human and clone, that emerges from the Shakira's novel, might work to foreclose that fleeting hybrid space uh, that's imagined in all lands of performance. Indeed, throughout the novel, barriers between real and artificial life are set up. There will always be a barrier, one of the Hailsham guardians of the kind of teachers at the school. There will always be a barrier, one of them tells Kathy, against seeing you as properly human. And these barriers, barriers are often they're often invisible or woven from air and light. They assert themselves throughout the novel. The primal scene of the novel plays out across one such barrier between the human and the poet. One of the directors of the Hailsham project called Madam uh, encounters at one point in the narrative Kathy dancing to a song called Never Let Me Go, after which the novel is named. And her view of the scene, Madam's view of the scene of Kathy dancing, takes place across this powerful but transparent boundary always intervenes in the novel between us and them, however we align ourselves. Uh, Madame, the clones have discovered, has an aversion to them, a deep-seated dread of their very physicality, which she, which Madame, finds uncanny and abject. It's the discovery of this aversion, this sort of discovery that Madame kind of finds in like spiders, kind of creepy, um, that alerts the, the clones to their difference from her and from the humans on the outside. I'm sure somewhere in your childhood you too had an experience like ours that day, Kathleen writes, again using that horrible view uh, what kind of community that brings us into. We too, she supposes, must have had that foundational experience that occurs at the moment when you realise that you are different to them. The recognition of Madame's dread brings the clones to understand that there are people out there, like Madame, who don't hate you or wish you any harm, but who nevertheless shudder at the very thought of you. There are many devices in the narrative for the access to this spiritual inside. There's an interest, for example, in telepathy, in the possibility that one can see the workings of the mind through the expressions of the face. Uh, Tommy is worried that Madame can read minds that she can see right inside you. And there's a fascination also with the idea that reflection or introspection might allow one to see inside oneself. Uh, Ruth, for example, another of the main characters when she's dying after the second operation, wills her eyes, wills her eyes, the phrase it, to see right inside herself. She wants to see what happens as she dies. Um, uh, the exposed inside emerges in the novel again and again, but perhaps the most insistent vehicle in this novel for revealing what you were like inside is art, or what's referred to in Hailsham as, quote, being creative. 
the students are encouraged to be as creative as possible throughout their time at the um, uh, Rather like, and I'm sure this is one of the satires that the novel's engaged in, rather like students on contemporary humanities degrees. And it becomes apparent to them that all, to them all, to all the students, this form of expression allows them to discover and display something hidden about themselves. The students submit their paintings and poems to a kind of annual competition in which Madame comes to view the work and select the best pieces for what she calls her gallery. And the students gradually come to see this selection of artwork as a judgment on the condition of their souls. One of the guardians tells Tommy that things like poetry, this, this is the, the classic language in this novel, things like poetry, pictures, all that kind of stuff, they reveal what, they, what you were like inside, they reveal your soul. Now again, there's nothing uplifting or progressive or utopian about this conception of the student's artwork as a means of discovering their intellectual and spiritual capacity. Indeed, it's one of the most sinister and cruel elements of the novel's plot. The students enter so happily into the production of those artworks uh, while remaining in such stubborn ignorance of their institutional purpose. Which I'll talk about a as we close. Uh, a rumour grows that there is available what is known as a deferral, in which certain elect students are saved, redeemed from their fate as donors, so they don't have to give up their kidneys and start and let them go and live freely and autonomously in the real world of the other human. Uh, and the students become convinced that their artworks are the means of this salvation, of this deferral. Um, the guardians double for the students as divine figures, as godlike judges who can see the state of their soul, who can determine who is just and who is not, who lives truly and who does not. And Tommy and Ruth become convinced that their artwork will prove that they themselves deserve a deferral because they love each other truly and equivalent. But the final turn of the screw in this novel is their slowly dawning realisation that the artworks produced at Persia offer no such testimony. Students imagine that their art is read by the guardians, as some of us may imagine our works might be judged by God, or at least by FR readers. The creations that they believe are a testament to the true, to the just, to the goodness of soul. But of course the works are gathered and read by the guardians under an entirely different uh, rubric, a different critical vocabulary. As Miss Emily tells Ruth and Tommy at the close of the novel, uh, they collected the students' artwork not to gauge the quality of their souls, and this is the key difference, but to prove that you had souls at all, which we told you. The reading of these artworks was not guided by ethical exegesis or by the rules of practical criticism, but by a kind of scientific behaviour. The students were not hothouse flowers in uh, an academy or a conservatoire, but screeching apes in a laboratory. Not Wilhelm Meister or Stephen Dedalus, but read Peter. The words weren't being used to judge the students, but to test them. Their art was a test of their humanity, a test that they could only fail the moment that they were subjected to. To test the students for traces of humanity is inhumane and classifies them immediately as less than human, preserving and enforcing that barrier between them and us that the tests were designed in. But if the art produced by the clones misses its addressee, if there is no possibility that the guardians can act as judges of this work in the way that Ruth and Tommy had hoped, it's nevertheless the case that it suggests the withheld possibility of a new category of post-human being. The artwork produced by Tommy in the fond hope of escaping from administered death is itself suggestive of such a category. As Tommy grows older and as the prospect of a deferral takes hold in his imagination, he develops a distinct and odd drawing style uh, in which he conjures particular, peculiar, miniature, imaginary animals. These animals are extraordinary hybrids made from the collapsing of distinctions between one species and another, between the biological and the non-biological, between the inside and the outside bodies. Their shapes conform so little to existing species type bodies it is difficult to find a category to which they fit. In fact, Cathy says, it took a moment to see there were animals at all. It was only when you held the page away that you could tell it was some kind of armadillo, say, or a bird, um, or a kind of frog, except with a long tail, as though part of it had stayed. 
It's difficult to allocate these animals as species being, and it's difficult also to determine what kind of material they're made of. They're metallic at one point, but they're also fleshy, they're rubbery, they're almost blobby. And this unreadability of the animal's shapes, this blurring of species boundaries, is compounded by a strange sense that they come to be in the opening of their bodies, in the exposure of their interiority. The first impression, Cathy says, was like one you would get if you took the back of the radio set. Tiny canals, weaving tendons, miniature screws and wheels. The animals are all on the surface. Everything's got shiny surfaces, Tom says. But the surface, made of skin and metal and rubber, is fashioned from these internal components, brought out of hiding these cogs and screws and shiny tendons. The kind of creature that's presented here, made from the failure of the distinctions that allow us to categorise life, requires, Cathy thinks, a whole new way of seeing, a whole new language, both of art criticism and of biological taxonomy. What I was looking at, she says, was so different from anything the Guardians taught us at Helsham, I didn't know how to judge it. <coughs> John's own sense that these creatures belong, belonging to no existing conventions for the classification of life spring to being of their own pool. It's like they come to life by themselves, he says. His protective feelings for them are not simply those of a creator, but those of an observer of some newly discovered and rarefied life. You have to think about how they protect themselves, he says, how they've reached them. He worried, Cathy says later, even as he created them, how they protect themselves or be able to reach and to fetch them. And looking at them now, I can feel the same sort of concern. Now, this is not to say that Tommy's animals themselves bring a new category into being, or that the novel holds them up as a new model of species being. The animals remain unrealised, or in some fashion, unborn, just as the transformative artworks in Ishiguro's earlier novel, The Unconsoled, uh, uh, never quite make it into being, and have held it. Uh, Tommy tries to show his creatures to Madame at the close of the novel. He brings, in, he brings them to her in a bag which he began to unzip. We keep recalling, of course, the clone's sense of themselves as body bags, which might be unzipped. But Madame isn't interested in them, and Tommy too soon realises there's nothing to gain from her approval no new lease of life to be won for him in displaying their inchoate striving for self-protection or their own blind struggle to reach them. But it is to suggest that in missing their appointment with Madame, in failing to testify to Tommy's humanity, these creatures suggest a kind of different organisation of being, a different way of thinking about the relationship between interiority and exteriority and how we fit inside our own body. Madam can't read these creatures, can't see them, because she sees both Tommy and his work and his artwork across the boundary between the human and the non-human, across the clear threshold that separates her from Kathy as she dances to Never Let Me Go, her own imaginary creature clutched to her breast. Madam cannot read these creatures as she sees them across a divide between the old world that is dying and a cruel new world which has no room for her conception of humanity. The Helsham project was conceived to defend that humanity, to defend it by suggesting that clones or artificial beings might still belong to the human, might be subsumed into a category of human being which might then remain unchanged. The testimony of Never Let Me Go, though, and of those mute, unborn, inside out creatures reaching for being, is that new procedures for the reproduction of the body will call for new classifications of the human new ways of understanding how the self spills, as in all ants, unclassifiable art into the spaces that we hold. Sort of sense of strangeness or uncanniness 
actually might come from a realisation that we possibly don't own our own bodies and that our own bodies might be incorporated in a sort of biopolitical production of, of productive flesh and matter in the same way as the people at Hailsham in the book were. And the, this, this sort of strangeness that you refer to throughout your, your talk often comes about, for me, I think, when, when thinking about the fact that perhaps this is what we are as bodies, we're, we're matter which can be used for particular productive purposes or sort of biocapital. Um, and so perhaps I was wondering whether, you know, possibly that strangeness that, that, we're, that we're talking about um, as these different visibilities emerge might come from that as well as from something else. I was thinking about, um, it made me think about the film District 9 with the aliens yeah. and there's, the, the, there's a point in that film where um, the main guy, he's got some alien DNA in him and the people from the state who he thinks are his friends want, want his flesh and suddenly he turns from a human subject to biocapital, essentially. And there's a realisation that, that he goes through when he realises that this is all he is now. And I wonder whether that's going on here as well. No, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, that, that I think is why the novel is so careful about setting up the uh, invisible or collapsing boundaries between us as a reader and um, the clones themselves. So, so when... When Kathy says, I don't know whether you had to do this, when you were, what, what, how, did, how was it for you when you gave up your first ball? <laughs> um, and, and what, and what there, there are kind of two modes, two moments that happen. The first moment is, I don't know why you're talking like this, I'm not a <laughs> um, That kind of rather, uh, almost like a species of racism, that, the, 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 the moment of protection of self from contact with this other. Um, and the second moment is the recognition, oh, well, actually, my body parts are only provisionally mine. Um, and the, the, the relationship between bare life or ourselves as biomatter and the process of, of subjectification are coming under such, such scrutiny at the moment. Um, and it's that scrutiny, and it's the effect, that effect of the, that scrutiny that, that Ishiguro is trying to respond to. Um, uh, and to respond to by, by working out how categories uh, of, of, of the human no longer, how, how traditional categories of the human, if we can maintain that, that phrase, uh, are no longer quite adequate to the experience of, 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 bio, of life under biopower now. Um, and also by, by watching as those categories sort of collapse, uh, looking at what sort of new, new, new rhetorics we need to, that would be adequate to speak, to talking about ourselves now. There's, a, there's the recent thing where the first person in Western Europe has had a hand transplant. Did you see that mm -hmm. um, recently? Um, and, how, and how sort of powerful, that, that somebody else had it and they, they, they t went along and asked to have their hand removed because mm -hmm. they, they couldn't. You know, they're, they're kind of, the process of, you, your body doesn't reject it, but your kind of mind does, because it doesn't feel like you, it feel, feels like a dead man, which, which doesn't happen with, with an inanimate prosthesis. But the, kind of, the, the experience of animate prosthesis, which is going to be the story of the next uh, chapter in our medical mm -hmm. history, is going to require new veterans. Are you saying that clones are non human? Is that how we should read them? The clones in Ishiguro or clones generally? Or well, I, I guess I'm broadening it out slightly. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the actual message here is because um, if you had other interpretations like the, say, the replicants in Blade Runner, that's your ultimate conclusion is that they are more human. Um, we are. We, we have lost our humanity. 
And I wondered if this novel is exploring the same thing, but in fact, it's the clones that seem to have some of our capacity and we seem to have lost it. Mm. So I think the, the, the Hailsham project uh, is set up by some sort of do-gooders, I guess, in that novel, who, who are troubled by the kind of uh, the idea that we've got replicants running around rather than the way that they take things mm -hmm. in, this, in this issue. So and, and what, what the Hailsham project is set up to do is to prove uh, that, the, that, the, that the clones are themselves like sort of lesser humans, um, and in and improving that, they, they, they what they're trying to do is to is to improve the rights of those players. So so human rights, they're saying, the, the conception of human rights are flexible, elastic enough to incorporate the players so that we treat them better, which is which is mirrored by an awful lot by an awful lot of rights activists. And so you think like where well, human rights should be expanded so that we, in, we incorporate for some people various kinds of primate, for others all kinds of animal rights. There is no difference between human rights and animal rights, and that and that category is expanding. Um, what I think what I think Ishiguro is trying to do is to suggest that that actually that the human itself has lost its organising power. So rather than saying we can treat these other, these others, these almost or impartially, sort of partially human people like humans. We, we're, at a, we're at a point in the history of the human where we need to dismantle it all together uh, in order to answer the ethical challenge that, that biopower is presenting. Because we've consistently tried to see others as subhuman, whether that be based on race or gender or whatever. Yeah. As, as an excuse for our own behaviour, so it's asking questions by projecting another, it's asking questions about us. Yeah. I mean, there are people who are, are having their organs harvested, but for some people, you know, those questions we can say as we read it as a privileged Westerners, well, no, people don't take my organs, but actually, there are people who are having their organs Against their point. And, and, no, that, that this does touch on the kinds of questions that Richard Rorty raises about the ethics of human rights. They, they, what kind of classification system do we need in order to in order to protect the right? Um, do we just expand the, a human category in order to include those that we think are vulnerable, or does that then simply draw the line somewhere else so that there's another group of people that we think we don't need to accord those rights to? Or is the problem a more systemic, fundamental one about the relationship between classificatory systems, our conception of the human, and our conception of ethics? I mean, that's what I saw going on in the Shiguru. There's a very interesting interview with him at the end of the film version, where he's, I don't know if you've seen that. But I've, I've seen the film, I haven't seen his interview. It's very interesting because he, he talks about what he's not attempting to do with it, and um, talks about the people's interpretations, but it just seems to be asking questions about us, about humanity, and where our boundaries exist. Yeah. You know, we live on a, a tide of consumptionism, which is fueled by other people's suffering and horrible industrial conditions. Yeah. And we, we tolerate that. Yeah. We may not be harvesting organs, but actually as we sit here, we sit here on other people's suffering in other ways. Exactly. And I, I, think, I think the novel is at its most inventive when it opens these kind of channels. Mm -hmm. Uh, between between beings or forms of material that are kept that are normally kept separate in order for us to erect uh, ethical structures upon them, and so when you see that there is this channel, then you realise you have to re re reconstruct your ethical. Um, okay. um, I feel say like when you said about um, how the producing the artwork kind of failed to prove that. Um, like, I don't know, what I got from the book is that it kind of proved that there isn't a way of proving that you're human. Like, because reading the book, what was strange was how similar they are. And rather than prove that that made them unhuman, because, like, I was putting myself through the tests that they were trying to go through. Like, I was like, if I made a piece of artwork, like, would that prove that I was human or not? And it kind of 
wouldn't, like his inability to um, make a work of art just proves that we don't have the language just to define that to define ourselves. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem is that if that um, if if you and I enter into any sort of contract or any sort of relationship where I'm testing to see whether you're human or not, there's already a situation in which one or other of us isn't. <laughs> um, so, so, and that's that's the problem with that test. Um, and what um, what what Ishiguro is doing here is, is as well as other things, is is conducting a rather withering critique of the contemporary university. <laughs> <laughs> where what happens when I when 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 I set a test for my students to see if they can write creative writing, and I apply the I apply the kind of pre preconceived learning criteria to them. I mean, something's going on which destroys the very thing that the system is set up to test. Um, a student of mine uh, uh, wrote a, an essay for me this this term. In the voice of Cathy, um, and, and in, included a covering letter that said, "Dear Professor Boxall, um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you're going to think this is good enough, and you're going to grant me a deferral because right? I, I just really don't want to graduate. I really like being at Hayden and Stroke Sussex. I stay. If it's good enough, would you let me?" Which I thought was very, was very, very witty. It's a way of, it's a way of reading what's going on. Share, although I don't think they 
for the grid on that. Um, uh, and my, in, my, in the way I conceive of this kind of argument, um, uh, Ishiguro and Kaseya both call for a kind of utopianism that something like a, the, the sort of pragmatic response to the challenge the challenges that the human faces now, but the, the response that you get from somebody like royalty isn't adequate to. So I, th I think this is, a, this is a very kind of opaque answer to your question, but I think both Ishiguro and Kutseya call for and perform a kind of utopianism in, in, call, in calling to but not fleshing out a new category of hybrid human animal being. Um, for which there's an urgent need for us to produce a new ethics. So, so for royalty, a kind of anti-utopian, pragmatic royalty, he'd say, well, you know, once, once you realise that all of our classifications aren't fit for purpose, let me just do that, and every time I see another, a bit of an animal, or a human, or a fish, or a spider, or whatever, then in that situation we have to make up our own rules. And I think both Ishiguro and Kutseya in different ways are thinking, actually there's a, there's a, this is more like a kind of a transitional moment in the world historical production of the human that requires for something much more like a more thoroughgoing reconception of the right and the good, which, which calls to a kind of utopian liberty. Unfortunately, we haven't got any more time left for questions. I've got a question that I can ask you over dinner, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you about the film Dirty Pretty Things. It's the only human organs, but it's a discussion. But thank you very much.